Thank you so much for streaming our latest message from First Baptist Church. Here at FBC, our mission is to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. We do that by thinking big, thinking small, thinking in, and thinking out. We hope that this message helps you as you continue to grow in your faith. If you would like to stay connected to FBC, you can visit our website at fbcloyd.ca, look us up on Facebook and Instagram, or download our free mobile app. Now here's the latest from FBC. Enjoy. Thanks you guys for that. That was, like, that was awesome and um, just so in keeping with where we're going to go this morning. Um, I appreciate you all being here this morning on the August long weekend and in the midst of summer when there's so many other options and there's uh, things that in so many ways we would prefer to be doing when the weather is decent and we've got that opportunity, but I, I appreciate you being here. And I, had a, um, I got a note from somebody here this past week and, and um, uh, we're in the middle of this series on becoming like Christ and he, and he was suggesting that maybe we should be doing this series in the, in the fall. And I appreciated that, you know, where he was going with that, 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 he, was, that he was enjoying the series and, and that he felt like it would be important that, you know, even more people could in, take part in the series. And, and, I, and I get that and I appreciate that. I hope that you're enjoying the series as well. But, here, but here's the thing. Um, August long weekend, five people or 500, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my best. It's my commitment to give you the best that I've got concerning the things that God lays on my heart, regardless. And we're just going to go for it, and this morning we're going to go for it again. And, and I trust that God is going to speak to us, that he's going to meet with each one of you, that he'll speak into your world, uh, that he'll make this personal, and, and that you'll experience him today, that you'll know him in your life today. And then that will make a difference for you personally and for us corporately as a church. So we've been looking at becoming like Christ according to a, sort of a, a pattern or a, an, a strategy that John Stott laid out where he says that we're called to become like Christ in terms of our humility, love, service, our suffering and sacrifice, and mission. And um, this morning, specifically, we're going to tackle the last two in the series that we haven't done yet, namely mission and suffering. And I want to spend most of our time this morning on the aspect of mission, because I think that it follows that if we can properly establish mission for our lives, if we can get that laid out foundationally in our worlds, that then the whole idea of sacrifice and suffering follows suit. And so we're going to spend most of our time there in mission and then tack on suffering and sacrifice at the end. Before we're going to do that, we're just going to pray. And before we pray, though, I want to do something here. It has nothing to do with the, the, the message content today. Okay? Uh, but I want to say congratulations to Mr. and Mrs. Zubiak on Tuesday for what will be their 64th wedding anniversary. Yeah. So I know that that has nothing to do with mission, or it's definitely not suffering. I just think that that's really cool. 64 years together, that's something that we need to celebrate uh, in in light of the world around us today. So let's pray, and we'll dive in. Father, this morning again, we come before, we, before you, and we acknowledge you as our God. And this morning, Lord, as we come together, I pray that you would be with each one of us. Pray, I pray for the Zubiacs today. Just, Lord, bless them. Thank you for their example, uh, their commitment to one another, and for the way that they've set the bar high for us to follow, to, to chase after. So be with them. Be with us now in your midst here. Come upon each one of us personally. 
speak into our worlds directly, individually, in such a way that we would know you by your spirit this morning, that there would be no doubt in our minds about you being here and you being active and at work. And I pray this so that we would, would, would be able to grow in our relationship with you personally, that you would take us corporately and that you would move us forward as a church. And also for the sake of our community too, that they might come to know you, those that don't know you yet, through our testimony, through our witness, that they would come to recognize you as their God as well. And so I pray these things now in Jesus' name and for his sake alone. Amen. You know, as I contemplate where we are at in terms of the body of Christ, which is to say not us as individuals, not even just us as FBC specifically, but as the body, the, the church corporate in North America. As I think about where we're at, and, and particularly vis-a-vis -vis this whole idea of becoming like Christ in these five different ways that John Stott has laid out, I can't help but think that we have dropped the ball in so many different respects, in so many of these areas. But if I was asked to pick one area that I think that we've dropped the ball in most, where we have most drastically fumbled, I would have to say that it is in this area of mission. The idea that we're to be on mission like Jesus was on mission. You know, I was, I was talking with Jana in the office this week, and it's one of the things that I value about working here at the church is just getting to interact with the staff and each one of them for their perspective and, and their commitment to the faith and, and to pursuing it. And, and Jana said this, she said that she thinks that we have become very good at inviting God into our world, in other words, into our mission, but that we're not that good at all at joining him in his mission. I'm going to say that again. Jana contends this, that we've become very good at inviting God into our world, but that we're not very good at all at joining him in his mission. So in other words, we set out our own agenda for our lives and then ask God to be a part of that rather than asking him to set the agenda for our lives and joining him in that. Making that our priority. God, you set the agenda, and now I will adopt that as my priority. I will follow that. I will make that primary. And I think that Janice hit the nail on the head. I think that's exactly what's going on. We claim that our faith is important. We pledge allegiance to Jesus. But then we go about defining the terms for how that plays out. We set the course by which our faith is important and my, my allegiance to Jesus works. And generally, I would go so far as to say that I believe we shape our faith to work out along the lines of the American dream, which is to say specifically that we have invited Jesus to participate with us in our pursuit of prosperity and success as well as an upward mobility for our family and our children. An upward social mobility for our family and children. 
And as that mission has supplanted our mission to be like Jesus, then our nation has drifted away from God. That we have drifted away from our Judeo-Christian foundation and principles, guidelines, direction. And we now find ourselves squarely in the midst of a secular society. And if I happen to somehow be right in that assessment, I want to begin this morning then by going back, so to speak, to the beginning and underlining again, establishing that it is God's priority for us to become like his son, Jesus Christ. I want us to go back and to set that as the foundation for our lives, to determine that to be our focus and our primary objective going forward, understanding that that is what God is up to. Now we find this most directly articulated in Romans 8, verse 29. So if you want to turn with me in your Bibles, go ahead. If you want to just jot down notes in your bulletin, that's fine. Verses are going to be on the screen. Romans 8, 29 says this, For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he, that's being Jesus here, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. So here we see very plainly God's intention for us to be made into the likeness of Christ. That From the very outset of God's plan, which is to say, before time as you and I know it began, long before we ever arrived at this point in history, that God had determined his plan to be that for those of us that choose to follow his son, that those of us that would pledge our allegiance to Jesus Christ, those of us that would claim to be followers of him, that we would then be chipped and built and massaged and molded into the likeness of Jesus Christ. Now this fact, we're not going to have the time to go into them all this morning, but this fact is corroborated and substantiated elsewhere in Scripture. So please jot these down, pursue them later, check them out. You can find evidence of this also in 2 Corinthians verses, verse 3.18. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13. And there, as you go to those passages of Scripture, what you're going to find is that God is working first by His Spirit to accomplish this. That the goal of being molded into the image of Christ is being accomplished in us by the Holy Spirit. And that as we mature in our faith, that we become more and more the likeness of Jesus. That our maturity is taking us towards a more complete picture of who Jesus is in our lives. That we more closely resemble him. We more accurately reflect him. And finally, that that process will be complete when we see Jesus face to face. That at that point, when we meet him in person, that we will be completely changed. The process will be finished, accomplished in its fullness, and we will be like him. So this morning then, that being the case, the objective of becoming like Christ needs to be paramount for us. It has to be number one priority in yours and my life as we understand that to be the clear and indisputable will of God. That there is no question that that is his objective, his goal for each one of us to become like Jesus. And if it is God's will 
then it is automatically our priority. You know, so often we wonder about what God's will is for our lives. And more often than not, I think that we contemplate that in terms of our circumstances and situations. We come to the events of our lives and we look at those and we wonder, well, what is it that God would want us to do concerning this? What should I do about this job? Where should I live? Whom should I marry? And while those are good questions, and I very much support the idea that we would take those to God and ask for his input in regard to each one of them, I can't help but wonder this, that if we were to be more concerned about God's will for us in terms of our person, rather than our circumstances, if we were more concerned about what God's will for us in, was in our lives, personally, in our character, in our perspective, personally, that then these circumstantial things would fall that much more easily into place. They wouldn't be as big a conundrum for us. We wouldn't have to spend as much time pursuing God's will in those areas because it would become evident according to who he is, what he's trying to do in me as an individual. So for example, if a guy, girls, does not lead you to become more like Jesus Christ, then he's not worth dating. You don't have to go to God about that. I can tell you that right now. Don't trust me, go to the word. But the goal of God is to make you into his son, the image of Jesus. And so if that guy isn't helping you, then sayonara, farewell, goodbye. by. And the same thing for you guys. If the girls are not leading you towards that, or if they're not moving you forward in your faith, if they're not lifting you up spiritually, then toodles. Adios. Now, that doesn't mean that they're not good people. That doesn't mean that they're not worth hanging out with, anything like that. They're just not worth linking yourself to for the next 64 years. Knowing that God's priority is to make us like Jesus frames a lot for us in life. Very quickly. Very simply. Don't miss it. And knowing that it's, Christ, or that it's God's priority for us to become like Jesus then begs this question. What does it look like to become like Christ. What do I do to become like Christ? Which brings us back then to this series and specifically to these areas this morning of mission and suffering. Now, before we get right into that, I want to stop here. And I mentioned this last week, but I want to underline it again for those of you that maybe missed it, for those of you that weren't here, for those of you that were, just because I said I was going to come back to it this morning. Two weeks ago, Randy Carter was here speaking to us, one of our camp speakers. We ask our camp speakers where it makes sense, where it fits, to come in and, and take our morning services over the course of the summer. It's been, I think it's been an awesome thing. But it was fascinating to me as I sat and listened to Randy because he preached this sermon with different words two weeks ago. As he talked about what we adopt as our mission statement for our lives. And where we need to focus our lives going forward. And it fits in exactly where, with where we've gone over the last two weeks. And so you know that wherever we find repetition, that occurs for a reason. Number one, to get our attention. When I repeat something twice, that helps us to focus in and get our attention. And when we repeat something, it also under, underlines the significance of what is being said. Church family, this morning, 
I think God is trying to get our attention. Randy did not know where we were going with this series. Out of all the topics that he could have chosen, he picked this idea of mission. I would respectfully suggest this morning that God is talking to us. And that we need to sit up and listen. Because I believe that he wants to do something in our lives individually and that he wants to do something in our life corporately. And he's asking for our attention this morning. He's asking us to not dismiss the significance of what we are talking about today. So what then did Jesus tell us about his mission? Turn, if you would, to Luke 19, verse 10. Luke chapter 19, verse 10. Here Jesus speaks directly and very definitively into that, this topic. It says there, this is Jesus speaking. For the Son of Man, and Jesus referred to himself often as the Son of Man, so he's talking about himself. Jesus said, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. There's his mission. Christ came to seek and to save the lost. Can I ask you a question this morning? How much does your life reflect that statement? If someone were to come along and were to look at you, were to look at me, if they looked at Doug, would they come to the conclusion that he is here to seek and to save the lost? Or would they, would they find altogether a different priority, a different mission in my life, in your life? Who are you connecting with today? Who have you made a part of your world? Are you out rubbing shoulders with those that don't know Jesus? Or are you safe and secure in a holy huddle? A Christian cocoon. Jesus continues to speak into his approach and his perspective. In Luke 5, verses 31 and 32, Jesus there says, Jesus answered them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Christ just lays it out again. He says, listen, I'm not here for the ones that are righteous. I'm not here for the healthy. I'm here for those that are sick. That's my priority. That's my focus. That's where I'm going to go. And it's important for us to understand this morning that those aren't just words from Jesus. Note that he starts off, Jesus answered them. We have to ask then, what prompted the question? Why is he giving this response? And we find that in verse 30, just one verse before. There it says, But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to his disciples. That is, complained to Jesus' disciples. Why do you eat and drink with the tax collectors and the sinners? They didn't like this idea that Jesus was out fraternizing with the pagans. That he was out spending time with the unclean and the unwashed. What's up with that? And Jesus comes along and he says, here, I'll tell you what's up with that. I'm not here for you. I'm here for the ones that are unrepentant sinners. 
I'm here for the ones that are sick, not the ones that are healthy. That's why I'm here. That's why I spend the time that I spend over there. We need to understand this morning that it wasn't just God talking. Jesus wasn't just spouting words, and we can't either. We can't just talk this talk. Jesus walked that walk. He actually did it. And we need to as well. We need to make sure that we are finding ways to get out from amongst ourselves and into their world. Those that don't know Christ yet so that we can have an opportunity to help those that are sick find the one that can make them well. His mission wasn't just in words. It was in actions. And just in case there's still a question mark in your mind, one more scripture that we need to look at. John 17, verse 18. This is as Jesus is just about to return to God. As he's about to leave earth, his ministry is winding up. He's about to go to the cross. And he's praying for his followers then, and every bit as much for us now as his followers as well. And he says this, John 17, verse 18. He's praying to God, As you, God the Father, sent me into this world, I have sent them into the world. So for you and I that are followers of Jesus Christ, we come to this verse that we need to understand that the Father sent Jesus into our world. That he came close to us. He didn't step back. He didn't stay removed. It wasn't just all about the holy huddle in heaven. That he saw sinners that needed healing, forgiveness. And he came to help us find that. He stepped into our world. He came close to us. And now, in the same way as God sent him, he sends us. And he says, get out of your little comfort zone. Get out of your world where you're safe and secure and get close to those that need Jesus. Who are you inviting out to lunch? Who are you guys sitting with at lunch? Who are you going for coffee with? What tables do you sit down at? Who is it that right now is out there being taken advantage of and oppressed. And, and what are you doing to help them to get into their world? Who's broken and hurt? Lost. That needs a savior today that you could help point them towards. Who's unlovable? And what are we doing to change that? This morning, now quickly, understanding our mission, let's look at our suffering. And a little confession here. If you go to John Stott, you actually won't see suffering or sacrifice is one of the things, the five areas that he's outlined. He calls it endurance. And I just decided to cut to the chase and go with suffering and sacrifice. Because fact is, is we don't have to endure the things that we enjoy. We don't endure those. 
We just soak it up. Endurance only calls for something that we're not going to enjoy. It's the only called for when we know we're going to suffer or we're going to have to sacrifice. That's when we have to endure. So, as I said earlier, I believe that if we truly engage in a mission, if we truly subscribe to it in our heads and then in our hearts, then it follows that we will suffer and sacrifice for the sake of that mission. That it has become such a priority in our minds, that it has become such a, a, just a foregone conclusion that that is worth my time and my energy because of what it is, that then I will sacrifice and I will suffer in order to accomplish that. And conversely, I would submit to you this morning that if we're not prepared to sacrifice, if we're not prepared to suffer for the sake of that cause, then I would say that we don't honestly believe in that cause. That we haven't gone so far as to really understand what it's all about, what's at stake, and my part in it. Here again, as we look at this area of sa sacrifice, of suffering, I think that we get this revealing look into our lives concerning what we believe about our faith. We get a snapshot that is crystal clear as to where we put our faith in terms of our priorities. We so often associate the options that spare us suffering or sacrifice as God's will. Those are the ones that we believe are God's will. Anything that would keep us from having to suffer, anything that would keep us from having to, to sacrifice. In this day and age, we believe that we've got the capacity somehow that we can avoid that, that we don't have to do that now. It might have been someone else's lot then. But in this world today, we can have it all without any of the tough stuff. And the fact is that we don't value suffering. That we see it as only something to be avoided, not something that ever to be embraced, not something that we would willingly endure for the sake of something that's far bigger. Something that I would walk through on a... On a, on a on account of getting to something with an end that is far bigger than my suffering and what I'm going to have to sacrifice in, in accomplishing that. We don't value that at all. So as a result of that, often I think we end up circumventing God's will. That we go around it as we mistakenly prioritize our comfort over our mission. This morning, we need to understand that God is calling us to the same mission as Jesus. And that as we step up into that mission, that it's going to call for us to suffer and to sacrifice. And that in our suffering and in our sacrifice, he is making us like his son. And that in that is inherent value and worth and as a result of that, then we need to embrace that. As difficult as that is, as challenging as that is, I'm not here to pretend that it's simple. You, I'd be daft to think that that's simple. But what I'm saying is that as I study this, as I understand it, I become more and more convinced all the time that it is worth it. And as I do it in my life, God shows up. And he takes me to places that I could never go in my relationship with him, but by that path. Once again, we find our example in Jesus himself. Mark 10, starting in verse 43b and on to verse 45, says this. Instead, okay, now you'll remember, this is, this is when James and John come to God, to Jesus, I mean, and, and they say, hey, we want you to do something for us. And Jesus says, well, what is it? Well, you just got to agree to do it. He says, well, tell me what it is. And he said, they say, 
we want you to see either of us, one of us at your left hand and one of us at your right hand. We want these positions of prominence, of notoriety, of significance. We want you to give us those things. And Jesus says to them, oh boys, you don't get this at all. Listen, you need to understand something. Instead, he says, whoever wants to be Come great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man, therefore again he's talking to himself, about himself. Therefore, even Jesus did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This morning, folks, church family, we need to start giving our lives as a ransom for someone And as we do, I trust that it will become for many. But we need to see fit to lay down what we have. Lay down who we are. So that others can know Jesus Christ. That's our mission. And if it calls us to suffer, then we have to embrace it and say, so be it because the reward the benefit outweighs the cost. Practically speaking, that means that we need to be prepared at times to sacrifice. That might be a promotion at work because it's going to take us away from our ministry. It might improve our financial position, but it's going to hurt us in terms of our mission. And we have to say no, thank you, but no thank you. It might cost us. We might have to sacrifice in terms of our material possessions. When we see someone that is hurting, when we see someone that is being taken advantage of, and when we have the capacity to change that by the liberation of some of our material possessions, that we can leverage then into currency for them, we might have to sacrifice. We might have to sacrifice our comfort. Scratch that. We will have to sacrifice our, our comfort. There's no two ways about it. We're going to be called on to suffer. We are going to suffer the scorn of other men, of other people that look down on us and don't get it, that point to us and laugh and mock because it doesn't compute in their lives. And we've got to be ready to walk through the midst of that. It's going to require us to suffer all kind of injustices, every type and manner. It's going to call us to suffer hurt and pain. All for the sake of our mission and ultimately in our priority personally to become like Jesus Christ. Church family, I think God's talking to us. I think that there are things that he wants us to do. I think that there's places that he wants us to go in the days and weeks ahead. I think he wants us to make a dent in our community and beyond for his son's sake. The question is, are we ready? Will we follow Will we take up the mission? Will we submit to sacrifice and to suffer? When we started this series on Canada Day a few weeks ago, we talked about how far we have drifted away from God in terms of our, our country and our nation. That we no longer resemble a nation that is after God, that is founded on Judeo-Christian principles and values. And that every year it seems to be getting worse. And I said then, that our job, if we ever want to change that, our job starts with us becoming like Christ. And that when we do, when we humble ourselves and put others first, when we start serving the body, our fellow believers, for the sake of the cause, when we start to take up our mission, 
when we start to love those around us, when we're prepared to sacrifice and to suffer, then we will see God step in and heal our land. And I said that at that time too, that that's the secondary result. That's the ancillary benefit. First comes the benefit in that we draw close to God and he draws close to us and we understand him better and better. He becomes real and our faith takes on this new whole perspective and reality. This morning I would say this. That those things very much apply. As we dive in and follow God and become like him, as we make that our priority to be like Jesus, then like we're told in Matthew 16 verse 25, whoever loses his life for Jesus' sake will find it. The life you want, the path to that is becoming like Jesus. Don't miss it. And the world that we want, the path to that is you and I becoming like Jesus. And just like Jesus told Peter, the gates of hell will not prevail against that. Our world will change as you and I become like Christ in our lives. Let's pray. Father, today again, oh Lord, I, I just ask once more that you would come alongside of us, that you would speak to us. God, reveal yourself to us. Demonstrate yourself to us. Convince us of this, God. Work in our hearts and our minds. By your Spirit, Compel us. Don't allow us to miss this. Help us to reset our compass, to gain our bearings, to build a strong foundation in a, and a priority of becoming like you. And then for each one, God, show up in their world and give them the life that they're looking for, the life that only can come as we do that. And Lord, that you would heal our land as we first commit to you. So I ask this now. For Jesus' sake, and his alone, and in his name I pray, amen. Next week, our junior high speaker, uh, Wes Lindy, is going to be here. So don't miss out on that. And then after that, don't miss out either. Gord, Pastor Gord's going to be coming and giving us a two-week series on hope, a series that we all need and our world in particular needs. So don't miss out on that. I look forward to seeing you.